All right, everybody, welcome back to the channel. Jason Brown here today. I have a very special guest that I'll introduce in a second. And today's topic, we are continuing my theme of how to teach kids about money. And more specifically today, we're actually talking about how to teach teens about money. And so today I wanna to welcome my special guest, Miss Rachel Murphy, who is an author, a speaker, a podcast host, and a money coach. Now, today we're talking about Rachel's new book, which is titled, I Am Not Your ATM, A Practical Guide for Teaching Your Team to Manage Money. Well, Rachel, thanks so much for joining us today. Oh, thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here. Now, this book, I, and, and we met before and I saw your book and, and I told you, I was like, I absolutely love the title of this book because that's how I feel as a parent of, of kids as well, is that you just feel like you're, you know, daddy's not an ATM machine. So, <laughs> so I'm always saying that to my kids and, you know, they're, they're much younger still five and one. So, so I'm, I, I'm already trying to teach them about the value of money and, and how to be responsible and how money works and stuff like that. So, so tell me, Rachel, first of all, how did you come up with the idea for the book and why did you, this is kind of a three-part question. Why did you want to write the book? And what, why is it so important? Why is this book so important to you to write? Okay, so I, it's a totally crazy story. Um, I had no intention of ever writing a book. I don't really like to write. I, I, can, I can write decently. I just, it's not like my passion. You know, like a lot of people love to write. They're always writing. Um, the book came about because uh, several years ago, my family and I, um, we were foster family. And we, being around a lot of foster kids, we could see like the teenagers just have no life skills, um, don't know how to do things. Um, even And then we became to realize that it's not just the foster kids. It's like teens in general. A lot of them just don't know how to do things. So we started out teaching videos on videos um, with our teens, this little little hacks, little, hey, this is how you change your AC filter. And this is what you do if you have a, a screw that's stripped. And then we do like um, goal setting, you know, just we throw in leadership stuff. And, um, and then my husband said, well, let's do a podcast. That'll be easy. <laughs> um, that was not easy. Uh, and so that's kind of how we got started. It, it kind of just, we just took one step and then we're like, let's take the next step. And then uh, through our community, we have a Facebook group of parents. And I would ask, you know, what do you wish you'd been taught when you were a teen? And the number one answer that kept coming up was, I wish I'd been taught about money. Nobody wow. taught me about money. Wow. And so I'm like, that's, that's interesting. Um, so let's try and get some money content in there. And uh, the book was not a thought. Uh, I just thought, let's do a money challenge in the group. So I'll just teach them how I teach my teens. And so that's what I started doing. And then like beginning of this year, I just had this feeling in my, in my spirit that just said, you need to make that a book. So, and, and it was, it was totally a God thing because I really don't have the patience to sit and write. <laughs> And you know, and you being a writer know that it takes a lot of work to write a it's book. Tough, yeah. Like you think, oh, I could write a book about that. But then when you actually sit down and start writing it, you're like, I've got three pages. I'm done. You know, like what else am I going to say? Um, so it just all came together. Like when I thought, oh, I don't have anything else to say, then I would get another idea of like, you should put this in there too. And so that's how the book came about. And I am not your ATM came about that that just popped in my head one day. It, it is so hard to find a, the name of a book these days because mm -hmm. all the names have been taken. Yeah. Anything about sure. money, you know? Um, and I just kept hearing parents say, I feel like I'm my kid's ATM machine. They're always asking me for money, especially teenagers. You know, they're all, they've always got sports and, you know, I'm going to this event and I'm going to this youth activity. And I need money, you know? So that's how that name came about. So it was an accidental book writing. I wow. Guess you <laughs> That's cool. That's actually a really cool story. So it, it sounded like it just all kind of came together organically, which is really kind of neat how that happened. So that's right. really cool. Very cool. So let's talk about a little bit. This is a big, big question that I always ask everybody is, 
is why is money such a taboo topic in our society and culture today? And, and, and why don't families, I know, cause you, you work mostly with families and teens. So, so more specifically, like, why don't families talk about money with their kids? Uh, right. It seems like, what, what are, what are some of your thoughts on that? Or, or how can we change that really? Yeah. Yeah. It is. In my opinion, it is the most important skill you can give your kid because they're going to need it, whatever they do in life. doesn't matter who they marry, where they live, how many kids they have, what job they have, they're going to have to be handling money. Um, so I think it, there's a lot of reasons we don't talk about it. Um, a lot of it is generational. Like our parents didn't talk about it and their parents didn't talk about it. And we could get by with that back in previous times without talking about it because we didn't have credit. So if you didn't have the money to spend it, you just didn't spend it. And you learn to save up to get the things you wanted. Um, but then our generation came along. I, I remember when I was a kid, my parents didn't have credit cards. Um, you know, right. so, so we didn't have that model for us. So then when we became adults, our parents didn't know to teach us about credit cards. You know, they didn't know to warn us. They didn't know the long-term effects and how dangerous it would be for us once we got out in the world. Um, so I think that's part of it. And I think that our generation doesn't teach it now because no one taught them and they feel like I don't, I'm not capable. Like I don't have the skills to teach it because I'm not winning at it myself. You know, so many people are struggling with money. So they're like, who am I to teach anybody, anything? Um, so that's one, that's probably the main reason I think that we don't teach it to our kids. And, and also in, um, if you're a person of faith, I think the church has really dropped the ball here because we don't want to be seen as materialistic. So we don't ever talk about money, but Jesus talked about money all the time and he didn't shy away from that. Um, it was part of life. He talked about life. He talked about money. He talked about trees. He talked, you know, he talked about whatever was around him. Mm -hmm. And I think we just have to make it more normal you know, talk about it with your kids. You don't have to tell them every little nitty gritty detail. You don't have to tell them everywhere you messed up. You don't have to tell them how much you make, you know, but you can teach them principles and model it yourself. That's good. Um, so yeah, you brought up the church aspect and that's actually a really good point that I didn't really think about. Uh, but like you said, the, the Bible actually, I forget the, the exact number, but I saw a quote said like, there's X number of t mentions of money in the Bible. It's, it's hundreds, right? There's, there's hundreds of mentions of money in the Bible that you can actually learn from. The Bible is a tremendous uh, reference for, for money. If you know, there's thoughts and wisdom in there uh, all throughout the Bible. And I know churches that I've, I've uh, been associated with have offered uh, some sort of uh, like money. I know Ramsey has his right. uh, financial peace. Dave Ramsey, I should say, has financial peace resources uh, through throughout some church ministry. It's like a church ministry, like right, right. Uh, like a debt, you know, budgeting ministry. But but those are few and far between, like you're saying. And and the church probably has dropped the ball on a lot of these uh, opportunities that they could offer some sort of money counseling ministry that could really help, um, you know, anybody, but they could do them for teens. Like, you know, I know you outreach to the teens, uh, that could be, yeah, that's a great, uh, a great thought there. And that actually Rachel transitions perfectly to my next question. Why don't the majority of schools teach personal finance? And I think you, you might've touched on a lot of it, uh, with the taboo stuff, but what, why, why don't you think they teach it in the majority of schools? And then if they do teach it, would it change anything? Would it even right. matter? Right. Um, it's not on the test, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> it's not on the test. No. Well, that, well there you go. That's, that's, the, that's the true answer right there. Yeah. It, it, we're, they're graded on what is on the test. Like all their funding is, comes from what's on the test. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of a bonus, you know? And there's the lack of teachers that can teach it because, you know, 61% of adults can't come up with a thousand dollars for an emergency. So who's going to teach it? And then you have the, 
you have to navigate through some parents teach think believe this about money some parents believe debt's bad some parents believe it's all right so what components do we teach without offending right. people um and you know there's a lot to it but but right. i was thinking about this um actually this morning um they've actually done studies that show that it didn't really matter if they taught it oh and and, par- and part of it i mean who knows you know i, I didn't go into a lot of de- i just just looking this morning because i was wondering that myself um who knows the whole the i didn't look at the all the details of the study but you know some schools that they say they have a financial literacy program but what does that mean that could be half a credit they sprinkled it into the math they threw a few word problems in there you know and it counts um Mm -hmm. the same as a school that has you know a really rigorous financial literacy program so we can't really compare Mm -hmm. apples to apples and say it's not i think every exposure you give to a kid is going to be better than none right um but i also think that the fact that we're teaching theory and it's not practical to the kids, they're not going to remember it as well. Like, okay, John went to the bank and put in $10,000 and he will get interest back of 3%. What is the answer? That's just a word problem. That, right. How is that different than their math, you know, than a math right. problem? But if you do it in your home practically, like here, here's your budget for the month, you know? I want you to, I want you to buy your own clothes this year. Here's your budget. I'm going to give it to you either every, every month or every season. Then your kid is going to remember that lesson way better than they will. The word problem they had on for their homework. Yeah. Practical application. Right. They, they've got to see how it relates to real life. And if it doesn't relate to real life, they're really not going to internalize it. Right. That's, that's a very good point. Very good point. Um, now, Rachel, I want to talk a little bit about, uh, some of the content in your book. And I know you talked about, uh, you called it a crazy project uh, that your family was involved in that changed your life. So I wanted to give you the opportunity to share a little bit about this crazy project that your family did and and what were some of the lessons learned from it? Yeah, this has nothing to do with money. Well, it does a little bit, but um, about 12 years ago, um, we started building a log home out in the woods here Um, we had no construction experience we took a two-day class um, in a classroom Uh, we flew out to Seattle and then we came home and shortly thereafter a year a year or so later we started building this house and we had gone through a ton of money problems ourselves when we were first married and it took us years and years to dig out of all of that debt and we dug out of it but our mindset was still not right. And that's another thing that a lot of people don't talk about. It's, you know, money is not that hard, really. It's, it's like 20%, is it 20% learning and 80% behavior. Right, right. right. But your mind, but if you don't have, if you don't believe you can do it, and if you don't think you're capable and you don't think I can be any better, then you're not going to do it. Um, so in building this house, uh, we got started. And once we got started, we kind of were committed. Like we were, you, you can't sell a half built house to anybody. So you better figure it out or that, that was the only option we had to figure it out. And so we learned a lot about ourselves. Like we learned a lot about failure because we would like hit a wall and be like, we don't know what to do. And we, and we, just had to learn to figure it out like you know luckily in this day and age you can google and youtube a lot and there you know you can find mentors so we learned that failure was not and it's not defining it doesn't define you you know it's just a learning chance it's just another chance to learn something better and you know do you do that enough and you don't fear it you don't fear trying new things you don't you know, I would never be where I am now if I hadn't have gone through that. Um, I wouldn't have been willing to take as many risks 
and, and I'm not saying everybody should go out and build a house and that's going to cure you, but just learning to put yourself out there, put yourself in situations where you're uncomfortable. Um, we learned how to be learners. You know, we constantly had to learn new things. And, you know, a lot of people just are so afraid of learning. You know, I say invest in yourself. There's nothing greater that you can invest in. You know, you spend, how much do, you, do most people spend a month on cable? If right. you would just take that same amount and buy books or go to go to a class or something, you would your career and your you know your life would change. That's a good point. Um, Very true. So yeah, so we built that house and and in the end we didn't we thought we were going to make a lot of, of money off of it. You know, really we thought we could build it cheaper than than we ended up doing because we didn't know what we were doing the first one um but but it turned out we about when we sold it we about made what we had spent in materials so we spent almost four years of our time building this thing um and it, and if you were to just look at that you would say well you guys were failures but we really weren't because it it totally changed our lives um changed the way we thought about ourselves and you know the experience for our kids. And through that, it, we learned a lot about what I wrote in the book about uh, the confidence competence loop. Like, you know, I feel like we've done a disservice to our kids because we're so blessed as a nation that we, you know, we just want them to have fun. We want them mm -hmm. to enjoy their childhood and not suffer or have any hardships, but they, right. they need those. They need the learning. They need to learn skills. Um, it's through the learning that makes them more confident as people because because when you become more competent in anything you become a more confident person and that'll let, make you more willing to try new things which will make you more competent and it just builds on itself very good and, um now that story you just told me about the house building what what i was thinking about the whole time was this is a tremendous story of perseverance right that you guys uh you know you faced a challenge as a family as a team and you persevered through it and you accomplished your goal and you overcame challenges and adversity. So that's a, just, to me, it's a great story of perseverance. Now you might have answered some of my next question, Rachel, because I wanted to talk a little bit more about some of the, uh, the key concepts of the book here. Um, so there's so many great tips and advice uh, that you have in this book, but uh, what are some of the most important key concepts uh, to help teach teens about money. I know you just talked about the competence and confidence uh, right. uh, issue. So what, what are some other things uh, from the book that are uh, what you think the most important maybe tips that you want to share? Right. Um, I think you, you, sh you need to teach them from the time they're young that savings is just what you do, you know, 10% at least, you know, make it a habit, uh, teach them to automate things because that's something that took me years to learn. If you automate it, it's a lot harder to change it, right? If you, mm -hmm. if you go to your boss and say, I want my 401k, I want this much to go into my 401k every month, you're not going to run and change that when something comes up because it's a lot of work to go there and do that, mm -hmm. right? You'll just figure it out. But if you say, oh, well, let me, let me just save at the end of the month after I pay everything, you're not going to, you're not going to make as big of a savings you know, you're not going to reach your goal as easily. You may save a lot less. Um, that's a big one. A, a big one. Another one is you need to know where your money's going to go before you even get it. Like have a plan for it because you know how easily it goes. If we, if we have no plan. Um, another one I had written a note down here. I was going to, I was like, I want to say that. Hold on. Oh, like I talked about, um, make it a point to be a learner right? as a kid, mm -hmm. like with some of my, with our teens, we will pay them to read a finance book and write a report on it for us. Oh, wow. Yeah. And like, do they do that? Will they, well, are they willing to do that? Yeah. Sometimes they do it. Um, okay. That's great. I'd rather them do that than pay them for other stuff. You know, like, right. I feel like, I feel like that has more of a, a chance of sinking in you know, then, then, I mean, we pay for extra chores too, but like, I feel like that would make more of an impact. I'm willing to give money for that, you know? Right. 
and they have to write a report they can't just read it because right that's great that's a great <laughs> like, idea. what did you learn from this you know yeah um that's, yeah that's that's a good one okay so what what age would you say because you have share with us do you have five kids yeah five and kids. What, are, what are their ages what is the oldest to youngest the oldest 24 okay and then 19 15 okay 14 and 8 okay so 8 to 24 is your right age. so what um just curious uh if because you've you've got the you know a good base uh, just uh, just uh, of case studies here what uh, what is a good age where where a child or a teen would really start um, maybe taken to this to this information from your book or where they might start really you know becoming interested in it is is there a certain age that you know my kids are five and one so should I is there a target age like you know when he turns eight that's when he's really going to start understanding the concepts or, or or is there a certain age range for that Yeah yeah that when they're little the I think kids are always interested in money because they see us put such value on it. Right. Um, but when they're five, six, they're, they're likely to lose it. You know, you, right. give, you give them, where's that money? Right. I don't know. Right. <laughs> um, and, and some of this is dependent on the kid. Okay. You know, some kids are more mature than others. That's true. Um, some kids may have special needs. Uh, but with our kids, we start fifth or sixth. Well, when they're younger, around five or six, you can okay. start doing the, you know, uh, let's, you could do chore charts or, right. you know, or you could do, we use poker chips at our house just to, okay. and then at the end of the week, you cash it in <laughs> and like a, a, one is a quarter that way we can keep up. <laughs> um, um, but when they're younger, you know, the, the savings, the giving, the spending envelopes or jars, those are good. Mm -hmm. that, that's a good start. I feel like, but uh, I feel like it's a good start, but a lot of times that's where we stop. Like we don't know where to go from the savings, giving, spending to launching into the adult world, you know? That's true. Um, so I feel like set up as many real life experiences as you can for them. Cause you're spent, you're going to spend thousands of dollars every year on your teenager. Mm -hmm. You know, you buy them clothes, you buy them food, food you buy, them, you know, transportation, haircuts. Yeah. yeah. When they get old enough to drive gasoline you know um why not make them the middleman funnel it through them and let them have the experience right. of practice practice you know practice is what what will get their brain you know just get them in the habit of yeah. you know and and if you start small think about if as an adult you've never been taught about money you get out on your own and you have a credit card or debit card and you get your statement and you have 50 transactions. What do I, you know, what do I do with that? Mm -hmm. But if you start when they're younger, you know, we, we start with cash and then as they get older, we give a debit card. Um, but they, they have to rec they have to reconcile every month. Mm -hmm. You know, good. if you, if you only have to reconcile two or three, four transactions to start with, that's not so in intimidating as, oh, here's your first time reconciling. You have 50 transactions. <laughs> That's true. That, that would be overwhelming for sure. Right. And then they can learn about sinking funds. Like, like what if you have an expense and it doesn't come up every month? You know, mm -hmm. like what if, you know, for girls, haircuts, a lot of them don't get their haircut every right. month, maybe once every four months or something. Well, I need to set aside a little bit every month so that when it comes time, then the money is available, you know? So they That's learn cool. how to make a plan. You know, you know it, it took me a long time to realize with budgeting that, that I didn't have to have the perfect budget. I felt for a long time, like I had to have a perfect budget, you know, like it came down from, you know, the mountain. Here's, here's <laughs> your perfect budget. You know, I didn't realize it's a flexible thing and it right. needs to change every month, you know? So, you know, if you go out and you don't know, oh, it's just something you change every month, you you design it for the month, you can feel like a failure every month when you do your, you look at the end of the month and you're like, I didn't, you know, I didn't have that amount in that category or I spent more on that, you know? It's just- Exactly. Yeah. Very true, very true. Um, well, Rachel, as we wrap up today, I wanna thank you again for sharing, uh, you know, some of the ideas and concepts from your book. 
Uh, and I want to give you the opportunity if anyone wants to connect with you. I know you do uh, money coaching. I know you, you're a podcast host and you have a website and stuff. So let people know if they want to, uh, you know, connect with you further, uh, you know, how they can reach you. Sure. Um, well, if you want uh, to listen to our podcast, it is hosted by me and our three teens take turns hosting. Um, we cover life and leadership skills for teens, and that's called Raising Confident Teens. And you can find that on almost any podcast player. And then if you want to pick up a copy of the book, you can find it on Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, and uh, almost all the other online real, real retailers. Um, it's called I Am Not Your ATM. And then you can follow me on Facebook or Instagram, Rachel Murphy Coaching. Awesome. And we'll, we'll link all those uh, up in the description below. If you guys want to check out our book or check out the podcast that Rachel does, we'll, I'll put all those links in the description below so you guys can check that out uh, from there as well. So Rachel, thank you so much for joining us. We have Rachel Murphy, the author of I Am Not Your ATM, a practical guide for teaching your team to manage money. Rachel, there needs to be so many more books like this written out. Uh, in the society today. Uh, and I, I appreciate your mission. I appreciate what you're doing for the young generation in our country and, and, and to try to spark change uh, in the next generation of how our, our youngsters manage and handle money as they uh, progress into their adulthood. So uh, thank you so much for Rachel for joining us today. I am Jason Brown. And to remember my favorite saying, it's not the amount of money you make, but the margin that matters the most. See you next time. See ya. <laughs>